Hello again. This particular video is a narrated PowerPoint that I made a number of years ago for my students when we talk about drag effects. And the idea being that there's lots of pictures here and how to, how to look at different aspects of drag. Now for the purists out there, I break drag down into five categories. You'll often find that they'll deal only with two, which is the form drag, the, the shape on the front, and everything else is considered parasitic drag. And I like to take parasitic drag and break, break it down into a number of different uh, subcategories. So hopefully uh, you'll agree with what I've done here. And then at the end, I uh, show you a practical way to calculate uh, the drag coefficients uh, doing an experiment that I did myself with my, uh, my RVs over the years. So I hope you enjoy the video. Thanks for watching. So this narrated PowerPoint will be talking about the effects of aerodynamic friction, something that uh, is often in our mind. I'm sorry I won't be able to reveal each slide as they go, but let's start at the upper right corner with a flag. So we have a piece of cloth, and as the wind blows by and the cloth wrinkles, you get differences in pressure and the flag flutters, and this is something that we use extensively for all kinds of images. If we look at cars such as this one from the 1930s, <clears throat> we see that there was no attention really paid to aerodynamics, it was about appearances. Notice that the, <clears throat> the cabin for the riders was inside of the wheels, which made the interior quite small, typically two seats, uh, four people maybe. And then um, as we got past the war, the cars changed a bit. <clears throat> we had different cars. You see that a 19, uh, early 1960s Corvette, uh, remarkably, although that looks very more aerodynamic and so forth, uh, again, they were making the cars primarily for appearance purposes. So this car is actually more aerodynamic going backwards than it is going forwards. So this is kind of, you know, the way it was because was, these were difficult measurements. And remember, of course, in those days that the fuel price was somewhere around 10 or so cents a gallon, a gallon. <clears throat> instead of uh, what it became later. And so by the time you see more modern cars, the cars all look very similar because the uh, aerodynamic factors do matter uh, because the fuel price is so much higher. And we can move on, of course, to natural phenomena such as airplanes. We can see the 1930s version where the airplane is simply just trying to get in the air. You've got three engines there. They're completely exposed to give them adequate cooling. And so the aerodynamic effects are not that serious. The aircraft's covered with corrugated metal to give it more strength, but of course it doubles the surface area. So this was all a matter just of simply getting in there with brute force. Then you see the uh, more modern aircraft, the sleeker plane that we fly today, and you can see the radical differences that we have used in to streamline the aircraft. Uh, in the upper left corner of this uh, image, you can also see the, uh, in this example, the TGV, uh, the high-speed trains in France, and how they have to streamline the nose of the train to uh, prevent unreasonable drag penalties. They have also uh, cut the number of uh, wheels on these trains in half. So what you have, instead of two sets of bogies under each car, you have a bogey at the junction between the two cars. And this redu reduces the amount of rolling resistance as well. And of course, then you have in the middle, uh, bicycle racing is not that, that big a deal in North America, but it is an enormous sport in France and Belgium, Holland, Spain, Italy, and so on. And uh, the riders in this particular case are riding against the clock and they're allowed to ride behind each other. And so the, the clothing they're wearing and so on is, is a, can produce significant advantages to reducing the amount of air drag that occurs. A rider riding in behind, uh, the first rider will probably do between 25 and 30 percent less effort. And so they take turns riding against the clock, and this is what we call a team time trial. So this is some of the things that we're going to be looking at today and a bunch of other things too, but you can see how drag effects are universal uh, in our day-to-day uh, -day lives in so many different technologies. So to first investigate drag behavior, we're going to look at the dependencies that exist. Now, clearly the size of the area we're pushing through the air is going to make a difference. So narrow things go through more efficiently than big fat things, big broad things do. 
Uh, but remember that the area we're talking about is the cross-sectional area. So in other words, if you go you, the direction that you're pointing into the air, the direction of the velocity vector, and then you simply cut a vertical slice of whatever it is, that's the area we're talking about, the cross-sectional area. We're also interested in the atmospheric density, which for much of what we do here on the ground is in the neighborhood of 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. But clearly, if you're dealing with airplanes and you go up into the atmosphere, that will drop. The speed of how fast you're moving is, makes certainly a difference as moving your hand slightly versus sticking your hand side of, of a car is going to make quite a difference. It starts off being linear, <clears throat> and as speed increases, you get compression, and the exponent will move towards being squared. But we're going to deal with um, the squared version in most of our calculations uh, this year. And then, of course, the thing, the other thing that plays into the basic dependencies, of course, would be shape. So what does the front end of something look like? If something that's going fast, an airplane, a high-speed train, it doesn't have a flat face. It has a streamlined face, a shape that has been found by experiment to allow air to flow around it in an efficient way. And so we're going to look at five different things that depend on drag here as we get through this. So the first one is going to be the shape of the nose. I'm going to just list them first and we'll get through this here. So the first one is form drag, it's the shape of the nose. The second one is how air spills off of the edge of surfaces. We call that induced drag. And then the next step, and there's a number of examples of that actually, uh, then we get into interference drag where we're pushing air through narrow, narrow passages uh, that can sometimes show up on some of our uh, uh, vehicles and so forth. Uh, we have boundary layer friction where the air is rushing against the actual skin of the um, object, airplane, whatever. And finally we have parasitic drag and this is of course the the things that are sticking out, our antennas and so on. But we're going to go back and look at them all in detail. But let's just start first with form drag. And so you can see the different shapes here and we come up with a fudge factor very similar to the one for coefficient of friction in which by experiment we determine how much these different shapes affect the drag effects other than that are due to area and speed squared and the uh, density of the atmosphere. So this is sort of a coefficient that works upon this and these are found by experiment. Now you don't have to remember these numbers in particular but it just gives you a sense of the different shapes and notice at the end when we get into the parabolic rainbow or teardrop shapes, pardon me, how efficient it actually becomes. So if we look at the second type of drag that I'm going to discuss today is called induced drag. And so what's going to happen of course if we look, let's just look at the lower left corner of the diagram here, you can see that there's different types of wings. We can have a wing that's very long and narrow and this is what we call an aspect ratio. We take the wingspan and divide it by the cord, or how deep the wing is. Or we could take a short, stubby wing, which is far less efficient. Now what happens, of course, is without getting into the details of lift just now, the underside of the wing has a higher pressure than the uh, top side of the wing because of the effect of the air aircraft being driven through the air by the engines. So at the end of the wings on either side, the air on the bottom is going to snap over onto the top of the wing creating a fairly aggressive spiral because of this difference in pressure is now released because the wing is is ending. What we also notice too if you look in the diagram on the lower right corner of this uh, panel you'll see that this happens uh, and re it, re it reduces its effect as we go faster primarily because the angle of attack is lower the actual angle that the wing makes with the air. Now what's happening of course here is if you're going much faster you don't need an aggressive angle of attack because you are uh, producing substantial amounts of lift per second by traveling further through the air than trying to do everything in a shorter distance. Uh, there's a similar example of this if you ride your bicycle and if you ride reasonably quickly it's very easy to stay on the bike you just make small steering corrections. But if you're getting down near very slow speeds, then the steering corrections are very aggressive. It's a similar type of effect. And so there are different types of shapes we've found practically that seem to show 
better effects. We found that elliptical type wings are very close, but of course today with computerized modeling we are finding other types of wing uh, shapes at the end are actually making it more efficient. We'll have a look at some of these here now. So you see in the upper left corner the famous Supermarine Spitfire, the uh, one of the British RAF planes that got us through World War II in the Battle of Britain. Uh, and you can see the diagram in the upper right uh, where you can see the vortices that are caused, the spirals that are caused as aggressively as the air snaps over the top. I notice in the lower right the curls occurring as the airplane flies through a cloud. And of course on the left hand side what we call a sailplane is a, uh, a glider that is extremely efficient in its uh, glide ratio. In other words how far it goes before it drops one meter. So these could be well over a hundred. It could go a hundred meters and then and only draw it to send one meter. And remember, these planes do not have an engine, so they're dealing entirely with their uh, experience with uh, aerodynamics. But we don't have to deal only with airplanes in this situation. This can affect us every day. Even let's take something like the trucking industry. So the transport trucks, as they go down the road, if you look in the upper left corner, have very sharp edges to them. And so the wind will come along the side of the truck, and as the truck is being driven through the air, it's going to create a lower pressure behind that will be filled in time, but not instantaneously. And so the air will snap around the corner and create eddies and turbulence. And this is, of course, energy and effort that's being put into the air instead of being put into moving the truck forward. The same thing will occur underneath the truck in the open space between the wheels. Now, if you notice, there's gimmicks that are being used now for tr the trucking industry, remembering that they're only getting four or five miles per gallon. So if you can increase the mileage by say one or two miles per gallon this is going to make 20 30 40 percent of their fuel expense so this is a very important factor and so this particular example here is called a trailer tail and it's a folding set of panels because clearly they have to fold out of the way when the truck stops at the loading dock so that they can unload the materials and this needs to be done very easily but when they're driving down the road, if they fold this back into place, then the air returns to normal in a much cleaner way than it would otherwise do. In this particular diagram you see here, other factors that they're also using in the sense of the trailer tail, as well as the uh, sky side skirts underneath the truck to keep air drag and issues from forming underneath, as well as aspects between the cab and the trailer and at the front as well uh, by um, dropping the nose on the truck and making it fly, move cleaner through the air. There's been some very significant differences done here on these trucks to make the costs of operation reduced. And so this is a real factor in competitive things in the business world that you have today. One of the other aspects that we notice with airplanes and even spaceships is that we have say in the case of an aircraft we have engines hanging from the wings and there's spaces between those engines and spaces between the engines and the fuselage and as you go through uh, the air at rapid speed this uh, air is forced through these inc inc narrower passages and what you get in that case is you'll end up getting pressure head that's building at the beginning of that passage as you force the air through there at higher rates the uh, dramatic examples of this, of course, would be the space shuttle where we're trying to put air underneath the wings and between the solid boosters and so on. The shuttle doesn't travel uh, in the air very much on the way uphill. And so because of the brute force factor, they just simply don't worry about it. But you'll notice that, say, a, a jetliner, we generally do not have uh, engines really close to the fuselage. We don't have engines very close together for the route. We, make, we balance them, in, and there's reasons for that for, for balance, but there's also reasons there for airflow, whether it is an earlier version, the 707, or the more modern 747. Uh, I draw your attention to an older plane that you see here on the left. This was the de Havilland Comet, the first commercial jetliner back in the early 1950s in England. And the British engineers, they built the engines right into the wing stub itself. And so therefore, they didn't have to worry about interference drag. And that was one way of the round it to make the airplane cleaner. So very interesting ways uh, to deal with this. But this is a, a, nar a, a narrow aspect of drag. A lot of times when drag is talked about, a lot of this is just lumped into parasitic drag. But it's kind of interesting to look at these different aspects of it uh, in a bit more detail.
So another aspect of drag that is often lumped in with parasitic drag is the rubbing of the air along the surface as you move through the air, primarily with aircraft. The air molecules at the surface are basically motionless. They're kind of connected to the surface. But within a centimeter or two above the surface, you move from that uh, motionless air all the way up to basically free stream airflow, which can be in excess of 200 meters per second for an aircraft at altitude. So there's going to be air rubbing on itself, and this is going to cause a certain amount of friction. And uh, so one of the things that they'll do is they try to minimize the surface area of the aircraft as much as you reasonably can. And now that there's certainly major factors here, but this is one of the reasons they'll do this. So if you see in the upper right corner, you see the corrugated surface that you see in the somewhat squarish shape to the fuselage compared to what you see today. And the two factors here are one, that the corrugated surface will almost double the surface area of a given uh, situation. And this gives us a very you know, significant drag penalty. The second factor is that the um, squaring of the cabin, or squaring-ish of the cabin, of course, gives us a more reasonable geometry for people and cargo and so on. But of course, this does increase the actual surface area. And it is actually better to build the plane with a mostly cylindrical cross-section, which gives us the strength that comes with that, which means we can use l l less or lighter materials because we're using them more effectively. And if necessary, make the plane a bit longer or necessarily make it a slightly larger diameter. But in the end, you still, and then just conform your gear inside, your equipment, your storage devices to fit the, the surface. So one type of drag that actually does make sense is what we call parasitic drag. And if you take it in its purest form, we're dealing only with things that stick out of the airplane and will cause drag just because they're, they're there. They're not part of the actual aircraft's shape, form, and function. And so if you look at, say, an older airplane from the war, uh, this one here had a uh, I think it's an ME-110 here. Uh, during World War II as a night fighter, you can see the very complex radar antenna they had mounted on the nose, which would cause an enormous amount of drag effect. Now, because this plane operated at night, it was less of an issue. If you look at a modern jetliner above that picture, you see, of course, uh, small protrusions here, there, and the other place for antennas and air data probes and so on. But again, they're all very slight. The landing gear is retracted in the fuselage and so on to make the aircraft as clean as it can be aerodynamically as it flies. Uh, if we look in the lower left corner, you'll also notice that aircraft use what we call flush rivets. So when we connect the materials uh, in an airplane, we don't use nuts and bolts because the chance of them coming loose will use rivets. And this is a piece of metal that is effectively squashed on both ends permanently that maintains the integrity of this material. Uh, but they're done in a special way on airplanes so that the top of the rivet doesn't poke up above the surface and add drag. So it is done as a flush rivet situation. So this all takes extra time and cost to make these, um, these devices work properly. For the longest time to measure the drag effects on objects, we used wind tunnels. And the problem, of course, is air is transparent, and it's almost it's impossible to see the turbulences without devices to help make it visible. Now, the two basic methods that were used, one is to use smoke. And you can see that in this particular example in the upper picture with the car, is that in the airflow in the wind tunnel is deliberately designed to be perfectly columnar as it approaches the object. And in that columnar stream, they release s some type of smoke material I'll use smoke in the word quotations, but it doesn't matter. A and then they can take video of that to show how this uh, gets affected as it goes past the car in this example or whatever. Another example was to tie pieces of yarn to surfaces. And it may amaze you, but even in the time of the space program, we would have miniature objects that had yarn bits attached to them. And as the wind blew over, we looked to see if those yarn all went the same way or if they if they fluttered, showing turbulence. And it's amazing how much of the high-speed um, materials and aircraft that were built in those days, were uh, their original circumstances, were designed basically using pieces of yarn.
Now today, of course, with the computer world we have, we use computational fluid dynamics. And this got its birth really in the 1980s, I suppose, and ever since then has been getting better. Uh, these are very, very intense computations and we're taking information from wind tunnels and building our models to the point where we really know uh, a great deal about things and we can put new things into our simulations and look and see what's happening. And this allows us to, to look at a lot of things, uh, not just airplanes. So if you look, for example, in the center image uh, down at the bottom, you'll see that they're modeling the air as it flows through the city. So when you air flows around these large buildings, it's going to get into what we call a venturi, and that leads to the Bernoulli's principle, and you can get high-speed air blowing th between the towers along some of these large cities. And this can be quite a disruption to the people walking on the streets or other circumstances uh, down there. You can also see, for example, a car uh, being modeled in this way, and the different colors indicate different pressures and speeds of the air. And whimsically, we even someone even put in a cow, and you can see the effects there of the cow standing there in the breeze. So it's a pretty uh, amazing new technology. Now, at the same time, this is very, very intense computationally. So we're looking at often groups and groups of computer processors making these calculations uh, so that maybe it takes an hour to find out whether this is correct or not. In the 1950s, if we were building an airplane, we built the airplane and the pilot would get in it and fly it and hopefully survive and if they decided well we need to move the wings back you know a foot or two or whatever a meter then they would actually literally have to take them off the plane and remove them around and put them as a very expensive process but today with computational fluid dynamics you can simply just change a constant in the computer and an hour from now you generally know where things need to be and this is one of the reasons why the aircraft that that, that are produced today in comparison come off the assembly lines uh, from the original test situations, uh, I won't say they're perfect, but they come off way better than they used to. Another thing that's also happened is in, this, in this computational design factors is we don't get into conflicts. So for example, if you're building an airplane, when you actually get to assemble it, suddenly two different groups need the same space. One guy's running pipe through there with plumbing, another person's trying to put an electrical wire, and they're trying to go through the same location. And this often can stop the, the development of the aircraft and cause non-trivial design changes. Whereas if you're using calculations uh, and computers to model this, all these problems are, are taken away before we start cutting metal. To properly compute drag circumstances requires the solution of some fairly complicated uh, partial differential equations and the use, extensive use of computers, as I already mentioned. However, and that's clearly inappropriate for grade 11, but we can still use a little bit of uh, mathematics here to model some things. And this is what we call the drag equation. And the force of drag is equal to 1 half rho, which is the density of the atmosphere, times the cross-sectional area, which I've already mentioned, times the speed squared, times the coefficient of drag. Now the coefficient of drag isn't just the factor I showed you at the beginning with respect to the nose cone. It is the drag effect due to all five things I've discussed. But the nose cone does play a huge factor and usually where we start with that number. It, this is generally only obtained through experiment or calculations through uh, the uh, computational fluid dynamics type situation. One of the things we can do in this situation that is reasonable is approachable for students in high school. It's kind of an interesting resolution of forces. As you fall through the air, if you jump out of an airplane or something like this, of course, it's understandable you're going to go faster and faster. The force of gravity will accelerate you. But we already can see that the force of drag is going to try to slow us down. And if we go fast enough, we're going to get to a situation where there's going to be a balance where the force of drag will be exactly equal to the force of gravity. And when that happens, the net force on us is equal to zero. And when that happens, we will no longer accelerate. We will go at a specific speed. And this is what we call a terminal velocity. Now this, of course, can be used more famously by skydivers, the people who jump out of airplanes and uh, uh, fall significant distances 
for fun and then at the last minute pull out their parachute. But let's, uh, and what did you can notice with them though is that they can control their circumstances by their body position. If they're spread eagled, they're increasing the area, uh, probably increasing the coefficient of drag, and thereby vastly increasing the drag effect, and that will tend in comparison to slow them down. Though nowhere near enough to make it safe for them to land like that, but nevertheless, it's a slower speed. On the other hand, if you were to fall head first or feet first, now the area is markedly reduced and arguably you improve your coefficient of drag as well. And there'd be quite a difference uh, uh, between the speed of a person falling feet first, let's say, and spread eagled. Now, if we look at the parachute, you now have this cloth material which is of adequate size to create a large area. The coefficient of drag is concave, so it's probably well over 1, probably 1 1.2 or 1.3. And so, and then we want the speed that we land at to be survivable. So let's say one meter per second or something like that. You can probably survive a little bit higher speed if you have training. But if you say one meter per second is not that much different than jumping off a table. And so as a consequence, this is a piece of technology that can realistically be used. If it's properly deployed and safely created and we doesn't have any failures, then it can uh, produce an adequate force that will slow a person, either a recreational parachutist or, or someone in the military. Uh, some parachutes today are directional, so they're not round anymore. They are rectangular, and you could pull strings, which will bleed air out of one side or the other, which will cause the parachute to move you in a certain direction. This is especially true uh, for both applications of parachutists in that you want to land and have more control over where you land instead of just simply being sent uh, by the winds. So what follows here is the basic derivation and we have to make some simplifying assumptions here as well. We're going to assume that the atmospheric uh, density does not change between the higher altitudes which is not quite true but would make our calculation very difficult. We also have to recognize that we're calculating the magnitude of the drag force. We already know which direction it's acting. It's acting opposite to the force of gravity opposite to the velocity vector as one falls. So we're used to g being negative 9.8, but in this particular case, we can get rid of, we have the fd equals negative fg at the top there, and we know inside that we have a negative g, and we just simply get rid of all of that, and we're dealing only with uh, positive values because we're dealing with the idea of computing the magnitude. The rest is basically algebra, and when you're all finished, you get the speed uh, is going to be equal to the square root of 2mg over rho a c sub d. Now what is interesting here though is notice that in the case of this one the mass is a factor in how much you are pulled down by gravity but it isn't a factor in how much you're affected by the force of drag and so the mass remains as a factor of the uh, terminal velocity and we can go back and look at this now let's look at an example of why a feather and a hammer land differently a feather floats down and it's you know you could take a fairly big uh, feather that has the same mass as a small hammer well the density the atmosphere is the same uh, and you know well what have we got different here the coefficient of drag of the feather is much higher probably uh, and the cross-sectional area is quite higher. But whatever the force of drag is, as well, okay, and that's going to make a difference. And if they have the same mass. At the same time, we also know, as I said before, is that the feather often is going to be lighter, too. It's going to have a much lower mass than, say, a hammer or a cannonball or something like that. So what you have, then, is the acceleration is equal to force divided by mass. So for whatever force you have, and the drag force can be fairly significant on a, a feather. It's also very light. So the acceleration that the feather gets is very high. And this is why the feather will be slowed down much more aggressively than, say, a cannonball or a hammer. When we study such topics, I like to show students a little bit uh, of, of some of the applications that are beyond what they're studying right now, just because it's interesting. When we have a rocket that climbs off a launch pad, you have a very different set of circumstances than, say, a parachutist. The rocket is leaving the pad with a profound force, 
That force is roughly constant. Uh, it does tend to grow as the atmospheric uh, pressure drops. And as it climbs, it becomes lighter because it's losing a tremendous amount of mass as the propellants and the exhaust comes out of the engines. And so the acceleration increases. As the acceleration increases, the speed will increase. But of course, that causes the force of drag to increase. However, at the same time, the rocket is climbing above the atmosphere. So what happens then is there's a point, because as you climb out of the atmosphere, the atmospheric density is going to, or, or is going to drop to basically zero. So that will win the day. So in between, though, there'll be a point where the drag force is the greatest on the vehicle. And given that the vehicle is, is probably supersonic at this time, it's shaking. There's going to be a fair amount of vibration uh, inside the vehicle. And so when we fly spacecraft, we have to remember everything we build that is going to go into that vehicle has to be willing be able to take these vibrations. We can't have our electronic equipment failing on us because it couldn't take the shaking. And it can be pretty, a pretty aggressive shaking, actually. And so this point is called max Q. In some cases, the vibration is such that in the cockpit, the astronauts have trouble um, reading the control panel. Um, in some cases, you would be uh, hard-pressed sometimes to actually push the right button because there's enough vibration going on. It'll depend. Each mission is a little bit different than other ones. In the space shuttle, the vehicle was uh, built to be reused. And so at this max Q point where you have this highest amount of, of uh, force against the vehicle's motion, they actually reduced the shuttle's main engine's thrust by 60% because it wasn't going to make much difference for it to go faster, and this reduced thermal uh, significant stresses on the vehicle. Now, if we go forward here to this diagram, you will see uh, what I'm talking about. So a lot of aerodynamics is where we look at graphs to understand what's going on. This is a, a reasonably good example for you folks, and you may want to pause this for a minute to get a good look at things. We have four lines on this graph on multiple scales. The blue line goes from the upper left to the lower right, and that is the density of the atmosphere. And that is measured basically uh, on the rightmost scale, as you can see over there, using an arc arcane unit. The uh, density that we're interested in, of course, is the top value. That is the one we would have at sea level. And down low, it's basically zero. The red line is the speed of the vehicle as it climbs out of the uh, off the launch pad. And the green line is the altitude, how high it has climbed. And the black line is this effect we call max Q, this the effect the Q, the dynamic pressure on the vehicle. So as we take off, we're not moving very quickly yet, so there's not a great deal of uh, drag effect on the vehicle. As we get faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, the uh, point gets met at max Q, typically around 60, 70 seconds after uh, launch depending on the actual vehicle's profile and the engines and so on. Above that, the as we see, the atmospheric density plummets down to zero and so the dynamic pressure falls away even though the vehicle is moving faster and climbing higher. Here's another aspect of this topic that of course is quite involved, but I think we can have a look at it. If we have a typical wing flying along and you're flying at, say, Mach 0.72 or 72% of the speed of sound, uh, all the air flowing over the wing is going to be traveling at less than the speed of sound. However, if we get uh, a bit quicker, uh, the air above the wing generally uh, starts going supersonic at some part. And then it will break back down into subsonic speeds. And the difference, the point where this occurs, is called the, uh, a shock wave. And as we go faster yet again to Mach 0.82, and these are all typical speeds of jetliners, you get shocks above and below. And so these are all factors. Although the airplane itself isn't traveling faster than the speed of sound, in this example, only 82%, but at different times, the different vagaries of the flow of the air over the wing uh, tend to, to uh, on occasion, become supersonic. This can lead to shock waves and it leads to some very interesting phenomena. Uh, if we have an environment which is very humid, and this normally doesn't occur at altitude, so you generally don't see this effect uh, if you're flying in a jetliner, but if we go to air shows where we have performance aircraft flying near the ground in a humid environment, you might see clouds forming halfway along the vehicle. 
And what's happening, of course, is that they, uh, they've gone through the shock wave. So you have this uh, air flowing over the wings, and uh, it's supersonic, and suddenly it's not supersonic anymore. And so there's a massive drop in pressure. And when that happens, it condenses. Uh, and this is just a straightforward chemistry expression. And and the reason it happens in this situation is the air is already basically saturated with, with water vapor anyway. Uh, they might tell you that this is where the plane is going supersonic. That is not true. Uh, the aircraft is not going supersonic, and it can't. If it was going to uh, travel in a, uh airshell situation in the uh, near uh, spectators and other buildings, you wouldn't dare go supersonic. You'd break all the windows. So instead, uh, it's the air traveling over the wing surfaces that is going supersonic. Then the shock wave occurs, and you get this market change. The effect can be even more impressive with uh, rocket launches, and the Saturn V was a, probably an easier example of this because it goes straight up. So it goes through drier areas, layers, where you don't get this effect. Then it goes through a more humid layer and then back to a dry layer again. And because the vehicle is moving fairly rapidly as it climbs, uh, you get these shocks forming and dispersing and sometimes forming again and dispersing finally, uh, all fairly rapidly because instead of flying through uh, in a parallel way through the air like the fighter plane is, it's flying vertically through it. So you get a different effect, which is really quite neat. It's fairly common on the internet to see pictures, either and video, of airplanes of different types uh, flying. And I thought I would compare the subsonic and supersonic airplanes in three areas. First, if we look at the wings, you'll see that subsonic planes almost always have straight type stab wings. They may well be swept, but they're straight out wings. Whereas the supersonic planes tend to lean towards a delta wing configuration. And these are very, very different. And the challenge, of course, is when you build an airplane, it's built to be efficient at its typical flying circumstance. So a delta wing airplane is very efficient at high altitude at high speed. Works perfect, works really well. Now that plane has to slow down and come in for a landing, and in that comparison, the wing doesn't work as well. Now the engines are very different too. So you see on the left, you see the large high bypass turbofan engine followed by the military version of a turbojet uh, with an afterburner. And those are quite different approaches. The turbojet engine provides very high performance but is limited in its fuel run, where of course the turbofan is meant to be a highly efficient engine that allows the planes to fly for very long times. And of course the, the most common example is to look at the uh, nose profile of the different airplanes. Uh, you see the parabolic, the paraboloid style nose of the um, subsonic aircraft and the needle nose of the supersonic plane. Now the needle nose of a supersonic plane is actually more efficient because it actually breaks through the sound waves, the shock waves, much more efficiently than a round nose plane would. So the rules change when you cross over the sound barrier. So for my RV drag measuring experiment, I did these at two different times in history. I chose a flat road on a morning day with no wind. The older version, I made a video of the GPS screen I had at that time. Uh, today I used my actual GPS that just led left breadcrumbs, if you will, and I could download the performance of the vehicle. Now, I don't know how much these things lagged and so on, so I'd accelerate to 100 kilometers an hour, steady it, put the vehicle in neutral, and let it roll out to less than 40 kilometers an hour, and do this three times and see if we could provide some kind of an average. Now I did not make a uh, profile video of my uh, first RV. It was a truck camper I built myself. It had sharp edges, a rougher surface, abrupt corners, it added weight to the vehicle, and I was getting, the fuel penalty was probably about 40% when I drove it. There was a significant vacuum above the vehicle that often uh, a couple of times broke the roof vent uh, because the pressure in the vehicle was greater. So there was, uh, but it was, uh, it worked out pretty well, and uh, you can see a picture of it here before we move on to RV2.
The second RV had a lot of parasitic drag. It had an overhead berth, which created a very poor uh, foam drag coefficient of coming up underneath with the wind blowing off the windshield. Uh, the airflow over the roof was a little better. There was uh, probably some significant engine friction because of the only three-speed transmission. And the engine was carbureted instead of EFI because it was an older vehicle. Uh, there was a vacuum near the back of the RV that caused the exhaust gas to be recycled through the battery box and back out uh, the window where I was driving. And it was pretty bad and it affected me quite significantly until I had my mechanic move the location of the exhaust pipe. So there's different effects occur here. And uh, so this was the first vehicle which I got interested in testing the uh, drag coefficient. And you can see here, um, we'll just let the picture come up to screen here in a second. And you can see now how the wind would blow up the windshield and hit the upper berth. The, uh, and of course, the shaping isn't rounded, it's kind of sharp. So there'd be significant induced drag as well, um, as well as a reasonably high ground clearance and non trivial induced drag from behind the RV. So uh, there was, we're getting approximately um, 3.8 kilometers per liter with this vehicle at the time. So when I analyzed this one, I ended up with a graph that looks about like this. I ended up with an intercept. This graph basically looks linear uh, over my speed uh, squared. So that it shows you that even at this fairly low speed, there is that factor. And the intercept was around 500 newtons. So this would be perceived to be the mechanical rest restrictions of the vehicle rolling along with no speed at all. And the math shook out. I got a coefficient of drag around 0 0.58, which I think is really too low for this vehicle. So I'm not quite sure uh, what went wrong with this because the rest of it all looks pretty responsible. So, but nevertheless, that was the result I got with this vehicle. So in 2012, we purchased the current RV that we have today. Uh, it has clearly the best form drag. It has a higher speed transmission, far less parasitic drag. And when it's tuned, it gets almost 95% of the original of the second RV's gas mileage, even though it has twice the mass. However, it is quite interesting uh, to see the results of this particular uh, experiment. So when I analyzed this one using the GPS, I got fewer spots, which doesn't help, but it still looked sort of linear uh, with respect to V squared. However, in this particular case, I got a very similar rolling resistance around 500 newtons, which seems to be something we can believe. However, the CD I got with this one was 0 0.82, which seems reasonable at least anyway, uh, but certainly higher than the 0.56 I got with the other one. And uh, so there was something wrong with the, the data, I think, out of the previous RV. You can also look at the table I have at the left here in the comparison of the fuel economy, and if you look at how many uh, kilometers per liter uh, per kilogram that you get. And you can see that the, uh, in the case of the final RV that I have, it's a far more efficient uh, approach to things in the sense, even though you could say you have gas mileage, it's fine to say that we have gas mileage. And this is why buses are more efficient than mini cars. If you take one bus going down the street and has say 40 people in it, and, or you have 40 um, economy cars, uh, the bus may have an, a mileage that is 15 times less than an economy car, but it's carrying 40 people. So these mass transit vehicles, there's a far more efficient way to move people around. So now you've seen the idea of wind tunnels, computational fluid dynamics, and right from the beginning, recognizing how drag affects flags, athletes, cars, trains, airplanes, uh, it really is uh, an almost a daily effect in our daily lives. So hopefully this gave you an overview of it. Remember, of course, if you study aerodynamics in university, you'll be dealing with much more involved calculus to sort out these situations. And of course, uh, using the computer as well to do these things. But this gives us a, a qualitative start on some of the concepts that are involved. Thank you for watching.